This is the story about one of Australia's most notorious hitmen, a man who operated during the 1970s and 1980s in the dark underbelly of the Australian underworld. A man full of violence and crime, suspected of taking contracts out on 15 people in Sydney and Melbourne before mysteriously disappearing. This is the story of Christopher Dale Flannery. Christopher Flannery was born in 1948 and was raised in Brunswick, a suburb in Melbourne, Australia. His father Edward was reported to be a heavy drinker and was abusive to his wife and children. When Flannery was just nine years old, his father left the family home never to return, leaving Flannery and his two older siblings and his mother. Flannery found himself attending various schools as he grew older and he started to dabble in petty crimes from a young age. At the age of 14, he was sent to the Morning Star Boys' home for his increasing criminal behavior. The Morning Star was established in 1932 and ran by the Franciscan Brothers as an educational and correctional facility. In 2012, evidence emerged that the boys sent to the Morning Star would try to flee the facility to escape torment inflicted to them by the Franciscan Brothers and Christopher Flannery was one of those boys. He often didn't speak about his time at Morning Star as he spent his teens in that vicious environment which made him grow into an aggressive young man. At the age of 19, Flannery would have a rap sheet as long as his arm from breaking into houses, robbery, and car theft, which eventually landed him inside of Pentridge Prison. While inside, Flannery refused to submit to any of the prison rules, so he was transferred to the more brutal part where inmates were ridiculed, beaten, and forced into grueling labor by the prison guards. But that wasn't a problem for Flannery, as he was no stranger to that kind of treatment. At one point, Flannery even stripped and went on a hunger strike, which attracted media attention to the harsh conditions of the prison and the terrible treatment by the guards. Flannery spent around seven years of his life there and was released in 1972. At this point, he was 24 years old and was free to find his way in the world. However, soon after he was released, he once again found himself in handcuffs for armed robbery. The court granted him bail, and Flannery decided to use that opportunity to flee from Melbourne all the way to Perth in the hopes of starting a new life. Upon arriving in Perth, he managed to get a job where he worked in the menswear department at David Jones. He had a good eye for fashion and always took care to look his best. When the store discovered his criminal past, he was fired. So the next day, Flannery and two accomplices robbed the store and fled to Sydney. Sydney in 1974. He was never convicted for that robbery, although he was sent back to Victoria and jailed for another crime that he had previously committed in Melbourne. He spent another three years in prison. After being released from prison in 1977, Flannery started developing links in Australia's criminal underworld. He went back to work, but this time as a bouncer at a well-known nightclub called Mickey's Disco in the St Kilda area of Melbourne. The club was a favorite hangout for criminal figures and Flannery met many of them while working there. However, he quickly became bored and decided it was time to transition into a more interesting job. Flannery allegedly told one of his friends, I'm no good at this, this crime thing. I think what I'm going to do is people for a living. And thus, the small-time criminal Flannery became a proud owner of his first business, a hitman for hire, or popularly known as Mr. Rent-A-Kill. Flannery believed taking lives would be the easiest crime to get away with, and he would quite regularly advertise his services to the criminal figures he developed ties with. And for a $50,000 payment, he wouldn't think twice about knocking someone. Allegedly, his first contract was on Roger Wilson, who was a solicitor in Melbourne. Wilson had gotten himself mixed up with some questionable characters and dabbled in deals with the wrong people. When they didn't get a return on their investments, they put a contract on his head, and allegedly Flannery was more than happy to take the job. On the afternoon of February 1st, 1980, the then 33-year-old Roger Wilson was driving his Porsche home when he was allegedly pulled over by two detectives in an unmarked car. Flannery and Kevin Weary Williams, who were working together as a hit team, were posing as police officers. They handcuffed Wilson, forced him into the back seat and drove away, leaving his car on the roadside. They later stopped at a quiet spot near Pakenham, outside of Melbourne. There, Flannery fired his weapon at Wilson and grazed his head. Despite the wound, Wilson managed to flee, pursued by Flannery, who continued firing until his gun was empty. Flannery and Williams dug a shallow grave for Wilson and then did a little housekeeping by driving back to the Porsche and moving it to an airport car park, thus hinting that Wilson had done a runner. Flannery would then go on a show to talk about crime which was a mistake because Wilson's farm manager, Terence Crompton, immediately recognized Flannery as the man who had been snooping around the farm prior to Wilson's disappearance. He would then notify the police, making Flannery a suspect. 
With the police closing in on Flannery, he became concerned that the body would be found, so he persuaded an underworld figure that he met at Mickey's Disco, Alphonse Gangitano, to relocate the remains. Apparently, Gangitano often told other people that that was one of the worst things he had ever had to do. Flannery would then go on to do a media interview denying all allegations about his involvement in Wilson's disappearance and claimed that the rumors about him being a hitman are ridiculous and totally untrue. In August 1980, the police felt they had gathered enough evidence to apprehend Flannery. Their key witness was Kevin Williams' girlfriend, Deborah Boundy, as she overheard Flannery and her boyfriend discussing what they did to Wilson in great detail. Flannery and those close to him believed Boundy remained a loose end, and Flannery hated loose ends, even though she later refused to implicate them. It is believed he arranged for her to be permanently silenced. On Christmas Day in 1980, Boundy's body was found lifeless, and it is rumored that Alphonse Gangitano had something to do with it. At this point, Deborah Boundy's name was crossed off the witness list, and Flannery was set to walk free. In October 1981, as Flannery was leaving the court building, detectives immediately arrested him for allegedly silencing a Sydney brothel owner, Raymond Francis Lizard Loxley. The trial failed to reach a verdict, and in a retrial in April 1984, Flannery was set to walk free again. Flannery then went on to purchase a house in Torella, a suburb in Sydney, and settled down with his wife Kathleen and their two children. Both Flannery and Kathleen had known each other for a long time, and nothing could keep them apart. Flannery was now feared by all who knew him. At first sight, he looked like a gentleman, but once people got to know him, they soon learnt about his explosive temper. It was said, however, that the only person he was afraid of was his wife. Flannery then went on to form a connection with Sydney's crime boss, George Freeman, and became his bodyguard. At that time, Flannery was still open for business and he received yet another contract. This time, the target was Terence Basham, who fell out with drug importers Bruce Cornwall and Barry Bull over profits from the drug ring. Basham became angry and attacked Bull, and in retaliation, Flannery was allegedly paid $50,000 to take care of Basham. On August 13, 1982, Flannery entered Basham's home, hitting him with a non-fatal shot. Basham's wife Susan came to his aid, but Flannery took her life on the spot and Basham met a similar fate shortly after. This was one of Flannery's most heinous acts as their daughter was also inside of the house and just like that, Flannery was able to take an innocent child's parents away, showing no remorse. Sydney crime boss George Freeman knew he had to get control of Flannery. However, he did not follow orders and nothing could stop his rampages. The situation was quickly spiraling out of control. It was now late 1984. Crime and violence were rife on Sydney's streets. Gangs were everywhere and cops were corrupt. This, in Flannery's mind, was the perfect environment for him to thrive in and he decided to pledge his loyalty to Eddie Smith and his gang. According to Smith, attempts were made to negotiate an end to the gang wars, but Flannery didn't want to stop there. On the 6th of June 1984, Flannery allegedly even went after a Sydney drug squad detective who was a witness in a case against Flannery's friend, Alan Williams. Flannery allegedly tried to bribe him through another detective, Roger Rogerson, in order to change his evidence in the trial. When the detective refused, two bullets came through his kitchen window, hitting him, but he survived. Flannery became a liability to the crime world of Sydney, and he threatened that if he went down for the shooting that took place at the detective's home, he would spill the beans and tell police everything he knew about everyone. At this point, the people running with Flannery realized that he had no loyalty to any individual or group and that he could no longer be trusted. On January 27, 1985, Flannery and his wife were walking home when a passing car fired over 30 rounds. Flannery was wounded in the hand. Detective Roger Rogerson was also seen near Flannery's house afterward, but was released without charge after claiming curiosity about the gun's damage. A few months later, on April 23, 1985, Tony Eustace was shot six times. Eustace was an associate of Flannery and had been reported to be a drug supplier for Neddy Smith. Eustace was later rushed to hospital, where he succumbed to his injuries. 
Police were able to question him, but he refused to tell them who had shot him, and they believed that Flannery was the one to pull the trigger. At this point, Flannery realized that he now had a target on his back, and fearing for his family's safety, he rented an apartment at the Connaught Building near the Sydney Criminal Investigation Branch. On May 9, 1985, Flannery received a phone call from Freeman, instructing Flannery to meet him. He went to the garage, but found his new car would not start. He rushed back to the apartment to call Freeman, who told him to catch a taxi. Nettie Smith claims that while waiting for a taxi, two police detectives Flannery was friendly with stopped and offered him a lift. Allegedly, Flannery got into the back seat and at the next set of traffic lights, another two police officers got into the car on either side of him. That was the last time anyone ever saw Flannery. Some say Flannery was executed on the spot in that car, while others think Freeman lured him into his house before he vanished. A coroner investigating Flannery in 1997 suspected Detective Roger Rogerson had knowledge about his disappearance. Flannery's wife stated in 1986 that she was offered $50,000 by George Freeman to compensate for her husband's loss. She said Rogerson made the offer, but she declined the money. Let me know down below what you think happened to Christopher Flannery.